and welcome to a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to the Japan Foundation New York for funding this series and enabling us to put this on each week. Today we are joined by Professor Travis Seifman, who will be presenting on the history of Okinawa and the Ryukyu Kingdom. Professor Travis Seifman is an associate professor at the Art Research Center at Ritsumei Kan University in Kyoto. He has had the privilege of studying at the University of the Ryukus in Okinawa for six months in 2016 to 2017 and visiting Okinawa numerous times before and since then. His book project takes the kingdom of Ryukyu, 17th and 19th century embassies to Edo, Tokyo, the seat of the Tokugawa shogun as a frame for exploring the vibrant visual, material, and perform performative culture of the kingdom, which has today become Okinawan traditional arts and heritage. He is also deeply interested in the arts, culture, and heritage issues in Okinawa today. Professor Seifman, it is a pleasure to have you with us today, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me share my presentation here. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, hi, Sai Gusio. Good evening, everyone. Um, my thanks to YCAPS for the generous invitation to speak with you today. Um, in the brief time that we have together, um, I would like to take us through a general overview of the history of the Ryukyu Islands, uh, focusing in particular um, on the historical shifts in the relationship between the Ryukyus and Japan. Um, after that, um, I, eager, I eagerly look forward to your uh, questions uh, and answer, question and answer session. Um, I'd be happy to go into a little more depth on any of the periods or points that I'm summarizing quite briefly here today. It's going to be a sort of uh, quick, you know, whirlwind uh, overview of the entirety of Okinawan history here. So let's start by looking at Okinawa on the map, um, just to get a sense of where we're talking about for those who are unfamiliar. Um, here's Okinawa Prefecture. Let's see if I can get some of these buttons out of the way. Um, so here's Okinawa Prefecture, this string of islands here, um, the large island Okinawa, and all these other islands to the south of it. Um, though the main island of Okinawa is only 1,200 square kilometers, um, roughly 1 18th the size of Shikoku, um, it's actually the next largest island in Japan after Shikoku, um, and it is today home to about 1.3 million people. To the south of Okinawa are the much smaller um, Miyako and Yayama Islands, and to the north are the um, Amami Islands, and others um, which are today part of Kagoshima Prefecture, uh, rather than Okinawa Prefecture. But all of these, um, the whole string from Kyushu down to uh, uh, Taiwan, this whole string in between those two, um, from the Amamis down to the Yayamas, are all together known as the Ryukyu Islands. <laughs> Um, so let's step back to about a thousand years ago. The inhabitants of the various villages and communities scattered across the northern Ryukyu Islands at that time, um, Okinawa and the Amami Islands, um, are large, largely believed to have been descended from the same stock as the Jomon people, who were the earliest inhabitants of the Japanese archipelago. Waves of immigration um, in the 8th through 12th centuries or so so roughly Japan's Heian period into the beginning of the Kamakura period, if you're familiar with those. Um, in the 8th to 12th centuries, these large waves of migration brought more people from Honshu and Kyushu, um, and maybe, maybe some from the Korean Peninsula, into the Ryukyus. And they intermixed, um, bringing significant cultural influences, as well as influence upon the genetic or ethnic character of the Ryukyu peoples. Um, depending on how we think about ethnicity, there are therefore um, ancient, ancient linkages between the origins of the Japanese and Ryukyuan cultures and communities. Um, but I think before we take that fact, you know, I feel like I have to kind of say something, uh, before we take that fact and leap to you know, nation-oriented conclusions about Okinawa or its people being fundamentally Japanese or that they've always belonged to Japan, I think it's very important to remember that when we go far back enough in history, there was no Japan, there was no Korea, there was no united conception of being Ryukyuan or Japanese. Um, this was a multitude of individual communities, um, each more or less interconnected or isolated from each other, scattered across this entire region of, you know, mainland and, and various islands. Even as late uh, as the 18, uh, sorry, as the 1500s, even as late as the 1500s, 
well after the establishment of an imperial court in Kyoto and of shogunates, uh, samurai governments exercising authority over most of the Japanese islands, even at that later time, almost no one in Japan or in Ryukyu would have thought of the Ryukyu Islands as part of Japan or belonging to Japan, nor would they have thought of the Ryukyuan people as being Japanese in any you know, real sense. The Amami Islands, which I've circled here, um, were seen as the very outer edge of Kyushu's local sphere of political influence, a sort of marginal border region. And Okinawa was decidedly beyond that, beyond where the last fuzzy edges of imperial or samurai influence extended, and decidedly uh, outside of being seen by anyone at the time as being part of Japan, either politically or culturally. One way that this interrelatedness, but also definitively, you know, definitive difference can be seen is in language. The Ryukyus are home to five or six distinct languages, depending on how you count it. Uh, ling linguists can trace the Ryukyu languages to having origins related to the Japanese language, origins in proto-Japonic proto languages, splitting off some 1500 years ago, if not earlier. Um, but they are distinctive lang distinct languages unto themselves, different enough that they are not mutually intelligible. Japanese people a thousand years ago or today would hear Ryukyu languages being spoken and would understand very little, understanding it to be a different language. So with that in mind, um, thinking of the Ryukyus as decidedly not a part of Japan um, in these earliest periods of history, let's delve into the beginnings of the Ryukyu kingdom. In the late 14th century, uh, the islands were rather disunited. Okay. All right. Hmm? Okay. Are we all right now? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I hope we haven't missed too much. Um, um, in the late 14th century, the islands were rather disunited. Uh, many communities in various parts of the islands were ruled over by local power holders who we might call local chiefs um, or warlords or sea lords, each with their own fortresses called gusuku um, and their own fleets of raiding and trading vessels. This map shows the number of uh, Gusuku sites across the island. These were not only defensive uh, fortresses, they were also vibrantly functioning towns and sacred spaces. By around uh, 1370, uh, however, the Lord of Urasoe, um, which is right here, uh, just a little bit north of Naha, um, uh, this town here on the west coast of central Okinawa, uh, the Lord of Urasoe, uh, was one of the most powerful lords in the region, and he gained the attention and support of the rulers of the newly established Ming Empire in China. Um, he agreed to send envoys to China to pay tribute to the Ming Emperor, and in exchange, the Ming officially recognized the Lord of Urasoe as the King of Ryukyu, um, as legitimate and sovereign. And then over the next 150 years or so, the King of Ryukyu granted that title by the Ming, united all the other lords and so forth um, under his control. By around 1500 or 1520, the king had established a more unified integrated kingdom, ruled from Shudi, just a little bit south of Urasoe, um, on the main island of Okinawa. Um, and the kingdom then expanded out, uh, invaded and took over nearly all of the other Ryukyu islands to the north and to the south by around 1570 or so. The uh, tributary relationship with China, meanwhile, continued straight on from its beginning in 1372 until the kingdom was abolished in 1879, which we'll get to later, of course. Um, and here's a picture of um, uh, uh, Qing envoys, Chinese envoys, officially investing a king and officially recognizing him as being king. Um, through this connection with China, the kingdom adopted numerous elements of Ming culture and customs, incorporating these into their already longstanding Indigenous, uh, indigenously Ryukyuan and Japanese influenced traditions. Uh, in this model of an investiture ceremony, we can see the Chinese influenced architecture of the royal palace at Sui or Shuri, um, as well as the Chinese style robes of the king who's wearing blue at the center of this image. Uh, royal court officials were divided into, divided into nine ranks of status as in the Chinese and Japanese imperial courts but they wore formal robes in a distinctively Ryukyuan style. You can see them in, maybe at the very bottom of the image in their black robes and red and yellow hachimachi uh, court caps uh, here. Um, and the Ryukyuan officials, court officials here, were not a warrior class like the Japanese samurai. Sometimes they're called samurai, um, but uh, you know, don't be confused. Uh, 
Um, they were not a warrior class like the samurai, uh, they, but they styled themselves after the Confucian scholar officials of China. They studied both Chinese and Japanese language, visual and performing arts, poetry and calligraphy, excuse me, um, Confucian and other teachings, as well as martial arts. Um, and they spoke the Okinawan language, but they also kept records and exchanged letters in classical Chinese and Japanese. As we can see in this next illustration, um, Ryukyuan architecture drew influence from Chinese and Japanese traditions, developing distinctively uniquely Ryukyuan styles and uh, forms. In music, dance, festival customs, and so forth too, Ryukyu took in considerable uh, Chinese and Japanese influences, but also developed its own distinctive traditions. Japanese Buddhism and Shinto and certain aspects of Chinese folk religion were, were adopted and, and adapted into Ryukyuan beliefs and practices as well. Um, but native religious beliefs and practices re also re re remained very strong and um, to a certain extent, you know, uh, survive today. Um, here we can see in a, uh, to the left, a sort of a small diorama model, um, a circle of Noro priestesses in white, uh, in white robes and leafy crowns gathered in somebody's home, uh, performing a winter ceremony, thanking the kami for a good harvest and presenting a rice and sweet potato liquor or wine to the deities. On the lower right, um, we see an example of a small utaki in Naha, um, a couple of stone markers and a small stone offering spot uh, marking a sacred space dedicated to a dragon spirit or deity. So to sum up, um, pre-modern or medieval Ryukyu as we call it, um, which extends sort of up until around 1600, was its own independent kingdom with strong political and trading connections with China and Japan and with Korea and various Southeast Asian uh, countries as well and taking significant cultural influences from those places, but being a very distinct cultural and political entity unto itself. Now, um, as we rapidly start to approach more recent periods of history, around the year 1600, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu united Japan under his rule, uh, ending the Sengoku or warring states period of Japanese history. He established himself as shogun and created a new order in Japan with himself at the top um, under the symbolic authority of the emperor. The numerous daimyo, samurai lords of each region uh, of Japan, each enjoyed uh, considerable authority or autonomy within their respective domains, but all were obliged to be loyal to the shogun. Just a few years later, in 1609, uh, Shimazu Iehisa, the lord of Kagoshima, all the way uh, far, uh, uh, far, far in the south part of Kyushu, Kagoshima, also known as Satsuma, um, uh, invaded the Ryukyu kingdom. He captured King Shone, as we see in the bottom right of this uh, slide here brought him back to Japan and forced him to swear various, various oaths of loyalty to the Tokugawa and to themselves, the Shimazu clan. Um, the Shimazu then allowed him to return to Ryukyu. Um, and this, this marks the beginning of a period in which Okinawa was for the first time in very significant ways under Japanese authority um, and kind of sort of incorporated into the imagined political uh, geographical space of Japan while at the same time remaining outside of it. What do I mean by that? Um, the kingdom was not abolished. Uh, the Shimazu did not take over its territory. Japanese people did not move into the Ryukyu Islands to settle them. To the contrary, the king was returned to his throne. The Confucian scholar officials of the royal court continued to run the country as they always had. Um, and in many key, uh, many key ways, life in Ryukyu continued as it had before. But the one key change being that the king was now answerable to the Lord of Kagoshima who uh, imposed heavy taxes and other sorts of obligations and regulations upon the kingdom, and who appointed just a very small contingent, about 25 to 50 uh, samurai officials, to be stationed in Okinawa to help oversee these matters. The chief reason that this happened this way, that the Shimazu did not overthrow the kingdom and simply seize its territory, was because Ryukyu's value for the Shimazu was not in the islands themselves, uh, but in their relationship with China. So by allowing the kingdom to remain largely independent and merely pulling the strings, so to speak, the Shimazu were able to have their own avenue for overseas trade um, and for the luxury items and wealth and prestige and power that came with that, skirting around Tokugawa shogunate's monopoly of um, Chinese trade at Nagasaki. <laughs> um, as a result of this arrangement, Ryukyu came to occupy a position in the early modern period uh, that may seem rather odd from the perspective of um, our world today. In today's world, of course, national borders are generally much more well-defined and, and it is usually much clearer whether a given place is or isn't part of a given country. 
in some respects, Ryukyu was very much seen and treated as an independent country and focused and functioned like one. And yet at the very same time, in some other key respect, it was treated as and functioned like a part of Shimazu territory uh, ruled by Shimazu vassal, uh, as if the, the kings of Ryukyu were treated as if they were Shimazu vassals. Um, it was meaningfully both a part of and apart from Japan. Uh, for most of the 20th century, most major scholars said that, uh, at least in English, um, said that early modern Ryukyu was a puppet state, that its independence was pretty much a fiction. In the last 20 years or so, though, scholars uh, have started to take a very different position, emphasizing the kingdom's continued autonomy and sovereignty, and arguing that it was indeed a sovereign kingdom, that the Ryukyu kingdom continued to exist in reality and not just in name throughout this period. Uh, following this invasion, the Ryukyuan court, while retaining extensive aspects of their own distinct Ryukyuan uh, heritage and continuing to incorporate Japanese influences, they also made extensive efforts to sinicize themselves, um, to amp up their cultural closeness to the high civilization, cultural styles and practices of the Ming and Qing empires. Um, not only maintaining a um, cultural distinctiveness and difference from Japan, but also actively working to amplify it. Uh, one place that we can see this is in the formal uh, uh, is in the the formal embassies to the shogun's court, um, which are the focus of my research, um, and in the ways that these embassies presented themselves to the Japanese. These embassies took place 17 times over the course of the 17th to 19th centuries, as ambassadors traveled from Ryukyu to Edo, uh, Edo, the city now known as Tokyo. Um, each time there was a new shogun in Edo or a new king in Ryukyu, um, they sent an embassy to uh, uh, ritually formally reaffirm the kingdom's friendly and loyal relationship with the Tokugawa shoguns. The embassies paraded through the streets of Japanese cities as they made their way to and from Edo. In these parades, they employed an, an, a, a, an array of banners and costumes and processional music um, and other elements, which from the Ryukyuan point of view, at least, were meant to convey a sense of royal prestige, of power and wealth and impressiveness. Ryukyu intended or desired, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, they intended uh, or desired that these Ming style elements would convey to Japanese onlookers a sense that Ryukyu's culture was refined, that it was high culture, um, that the Ryukyuans were civilized people worthy of respect. These Ming elements were also symbols of the Ming and Qing dynasties, uh, formal investing, uh, investiture and recognition of Ryukyuan sovereignty, right? Symbols that Ryukyu was not part of Japan, not subordinate or conquered by Japan, but was an independent sovereign country recognized by China and worthy of respect. The Shimazu and the Tokugawa ironically supported and, and encouraged this intentional effort um, to display Ryukyuan foreignness, um, Ryukyuan non-Japanese-ness. Uh, in fact, they went so far as to forbid the Ryukyuans from wearing Japanese clothing, speaking in Japanese, or otherwise presenting themselves in a way that might have them confused for being Japanese. <laughs> Doing so, emphasizing this foreignness, allowed the Shimazu to enhance their own prestige as the only, the only uh, daimyo house, the only wards to claim a foreign kingdom among their vassals. And similarly, the Tokugawa shoguns were able to point to these Ryukyuan embassies and to uh, embassies from Korea as symbols of how Tokugawa power and virtue was known even in foreign lands. That even foreign kingdoms recognized the power and virtue of Tokugawa shoguns and sent embassies um, to pay respects and present gifts. <laughs> Ryukyu's quasi-independent position in relation to samurai authorities um, and its active cultivation of, and performance of cultural distinctiveness persisted for more than 250 years. Um, in 1868, the Tokugawa shogunate then fell in what's called the Meiji Restoration, and it was replaced by a new government that worked to transform Japan in a great many ways into a country more closely resembling what the Western powers at that time thought a modern country uh, uh, should look and operate like. One element of becoming a modern nation state was for Japan to assert its territorial boundaries, to state them clearly, so as to prevent Western powers from colonizing or otherwise interfering in any lands that they saw as, claim, uh, as being unclaimed or, um, uh, or, or ambiguous. And so to that end, the Meiji government strengthened um, Japan's claims to Tsushima, Hokkaido, the Ogasawara Islands, um, and the Ryukyus declaring these territories no longer ambiguous, but definitively part of Japan. The, dis the dismantling of the kingdom took place in several stages over the course of the 1870s, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll just say that in 1879, uh, major government officials fully declared the kingdom abolished, 
and its lands annexed as uh, Okinawa Prefecture. <clears throat> Japanese, people, Japanese officials saw the people of the Ryukyu Islands as decidedly different from the Japanese and saw their languages and folk customs as not only different, uh, but also primitive, backwards, decidedly unmodern, um, and in need of being Japanized or modernized. Um, and so in a great many, as in a great many comparable situations around the world, um, uh, uh, comparable, uh, you know, colonial uh, situations, uh, and also non-colonial, I suppose, um, extensive efforts were made in the 1900s through the 1940s, both in public school curricula and in various other ways, to suppress or eliminate uh, Ryukyuan languages and folk customs, and to educate, acculturate, assimilate the people of the islands into new national standards of Japanese language, customs, national identity, and so forth, essentially seeking to make them into Japanese people, calling this modernization or the correction of uncivilized customs. And yet, even as these assimilation efforts were operating on a cultural framework, right, the idea that people could, could become Japanese simply by changing their customs, at the same time, uh, modern concepts of race and ethnicity were gaining strength and currency, and ideas that Okinawans were genetically, ethnically, racially, inherently non-Japanese, ran counter to these um, assimilationist ideas. Even as Okinawans took on Japanese names, learned standard Japanese language, studied standard Japanese nationalized curriculum in public school, excuse me, and in various other ways became Japanese, um, this notion of their foreignness, of their inferiority to true full Japanese people persisted. And in connection with that, um, the main island of Okinawa was devastated in World War II, becoming the site of the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. By most estimates, one quarter or even one third of the Okinawan civilian population lost their lives as the Japanese military dug in and used Okinawa as an island fortress. It's often said that the Japanese used Okinawa Island essentially as a sacrificial pawn, allowing it to become a battlefield um, and intentionally uh, trying to make that battle as hard fought as possible without regard, without sufficient regard um, for the well being of the Okinawan civilian population in the hopes that mainland Japan and mainland Japanese people would be spared any land battles and thus spared that kind of death and destruction. After the Empire of Japan's surrender in 1945, allied forces led primarily by the United States occupied and governed Japan for seven years from 1945 to 1952. Uh, this included implementing a variety of policies aimed at dismantling Japanese militarism and imperialism and replacing them with a more democratic and American-friendly uh, cultural and culture and politics. At the end of this, in 1952, uh, Japan was restored to self-governance, and much of the American military presence was removed. However, Tokyo and Washington decided that uh, Okinawa Prefecture would remain under, uh, uh, under occupation. A significant portion of the American occupation military presence was then not truly removed from Japan entirely, but merely relocated to Okinawa. The occupation authorities in Okinawa, known as uh, ASCAR or USCAR, the U.S. Civil, Civil Administration of the Ryukyus, um, made great efforts to protect, feed, clothe, house, and otherwise aid uh, Okinawan civilians in the years immediately after the war, as well as to rebuild roads, schools, and other infrastructure, even as they also commandeered a massive portion of the island's land area for the construction of military bases, fencing these in and blocking people from returning to or rebuilding their ancestral villages. Oscar also oversaw a number of significant programs promoting Okinawan culture and identity, restoring significant historical sites destroyed in the war, and organizing a public school curriculum for educating children about Okinawan history and culture. But Oscar's priorities were always primarily strategic and geopolitical, viewing Okinawa as the keystone of the Pacific, as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, in essence, one giant military base from which to defend Japanese and American interests in the region against the threat of growing communist influence from the Soviet Union and China. Okinawans enjoyed limited uh, democratically elected self-governance through what was called the Government of the Ryukyu Islands or GRI, but under the authority or oversight of Oscar. Protests against the military presence and against the use of Okinawa, a place so devastated by war as a base of operations from which to fight a war in Vietnam. Uh, these protests were sometimes met with violence, but were most often suppressed by other means. Here we have an image of soldiers pointing deadly weapons at civilian base workers conducting a labor strike, uh, though similar scenes also took place when it came to more explicitly political anti-war or anti-occupation protests. Politicians such as uh, Senaga Kamejiro, 
who were particularly strongly against the occupation or who were seen as aligned with socialism or communism were at times removed from office um, or arrested or jailed um, even after being you know, democratically elected. Eventually in 1969, Tokyo and Washington reached an agreement to end the occupation and restore Okinawa in 1972 to its full status as a prefecture of Japan with the Okinawan people restored to you know, enjoying the same legal and political uh, status, rights, freedoms, protections as any other Japanese citizen. Um, as in the unilateral declaration by Tokyo in 1879 to abolish the Ryukyu Kingdom and annex its lands, and as in the agreement between Washington and Tokyo to continue the occupation in Okinawa after 1952, the terms and details of this 1972 reversion of Okinawa were again agreed upon by Washington and Tokyo without any significant uh, consultation with or involvement of Okinawan representatives. Okinawans who hoped that reversion would bring an end to the US military presence in the islands found that it did not. Um, and as we're all aware, today Okinawa continues to house a disproportionate percentage of the US military presence in Japan, uh, which occupies, I believe, around 15% of the land area of the island. Uh, the <clears throat> public opinion surveys, formal government referendums, and the results of local and prefectural elections, as well as countless pieces published in newspapers, magazines, books, and elsewhere, along with extensive in-person protests, continually show that a majority of Okinawa residents are opposed to the military presence, either entirely or in part, and are opposed in particular to any new base construction. Yet decisions made in Tokyo and Washington and between them uh, continue to have an outsized impact on life in Okinawa and on the future of the Ryukyu Islands and their people. Um, so just to sum up, um, the Ryukyu Islands were once an independent kingdom, sovereign and separate from Japan, formally recognized by all in the region, um, uh, as, as independent and as sovereign, right? Um, and with vibrant, distinct cultures unto themselves. Today, the islands are very much a part of Japan, politically, legally, economically, and in many ways, culturally, uh, but they also remain apart from, unique among the other prefectures in Japan in notable ways. Uh, life in Okinawa today, as anywhere, is the result, the product of all that came before. Um, and in order to understand Okinawa today, I think, we, I think we must understand it through the lens of historical context. Okinawa is the only prefecture to have previously been an independent sovereign kingdom with its own distinct subtropical island culture and strong ties to China and elsewhere in the region, uh, annexed by Japan only 150 years ago. Um, although Hokkaido was also annexed only about 150 years ago. That's a, a whole separate story there. Um, Okinawa is the only prefecture to have been devastated by on the ground fighting in World War II um, in the way that it was. And it's the only one to have been under American occupation for 20 years longer than the rest of Japan uh, and you know all the kind of cultural impacts sort of Americanization and so forth. Um, that's a result of that. And the only one to bear this, this degree of uh, ongoing military presence and political tensions um, that it does today. So um, I hope this overview today, brief as it was, sort of compressed as it was, uh, I hope that it was interesting um, and that it has helped provide some insights towards a deeper understanding of Okinawa's past and today. Uh, and I'll end there. Um, Thank you so much, Professor Seifman, for that wonderful presentation. It was really, really interesting. Uh, so now uh, I would like to begin the Q&A session. Um, so to begin, I'm very curious. Um, so you, in your presentation, you mentioned about Okinawa going through this period of assimilation to become Japanese. Um, besides security reasons uh, behind why the U.S. bases remain in Japan uh, to the extent in which there's so many, um, why do you think there is an estrangement that continues to remain between Okinawa and Tokyo? You, me you mentioned several reasons, but uh, is there one specific reason that you believe for this kind of strained relationship? Oh, sure. Um, in terms of the strained relationship, um, I mean, to be honest, I, I think the, I'm, I'm trying to think if I'm sort of forgetting something big that I'm, you shouldn't, shouldn't be forgetting. Um, I, 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 th I think the military base issue is probably really the main one. And, you know, I want to, I want to be clear that the military base issue is a complicated one, and I, I don't mean to—I um, don't know if I've sort of 
I hope I haven't given the impression that, uh, you know, that I'm 100% against it or that Okinawan, 100% of Okinawan people are 100% against it. It's certainly complicated. Um, and uh, yes, it, it's definitely complicated. But uh, yeah, I think that's probably the main piece of it. And, it been, and I think for a lot of Okinawans, it is, it's intertwined with this history of um, this history of assimilation, this history of, um, um, sorry, uh, you know, uh, Tokyo allowing Okinawa to become a battlefield in the way that it did. So I think a lot of people sort of view it as sort of all interconnected, the way the ways that Tokyo has treated, or the ways that Japan has treated Okinawa, right? Um, and whether there's been sort of sufficient recognition of that or apologies or uh, is, is a whole nother, yeah. And people would disagree on whether there has or hasn't been, or that's a whole lengthy thing as well. So that kind of, um, that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, why, if, if, if Tokyo or the, the government, the Japanese government really wanted for Okinawa to become Japanese, so to speak, why did it take so long? Why did the Okinawan people go through a period of like gaining rights and losing rights and gaining rights again? Why did it this take so long for them to have the same rights as like mainland Japanese people? Um, I think in, in terms of the pre-war situation and in, in the Meiji period up until the pre-war, um, I think part of it is simply because um, the government, the Japanese government itself, well, the Japanese government itself, as well as the people in Okinawa, you know, went through periods of change, um, went through different periods of uh, what should the policy be, or you know, sort of changing attitudes um, and things like this. So, you know, uh, should we should we impose very strong assimilation? Should we not? Um, you know, different um, um, different governments sort of went through different phases. Of thinking about it differently, and you know, and, and mainland Japan itself, uh, you know, just the experience of people living in Tokyo or Kyoto or, you know, whatever Akita, or whatever, um, went through also uh, um, sort of periods of sort of freer, freer democracy in the 1920s, and you know, heavier authoritarianism in the 1930s. So you know, things uh, things shift over time. Different attitudes about how it should be, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Patricia Yarrow asks, um, to kind of go back to your presentation, um, what are the Japanese names pointing to the Okinawa main island referring to? Uh, okay. Yeah, my apologies. I know there's there was a lot on those, uh, especially on your very earliest slides. Um, let me, sorry. Let me go back. Whoops. Let me go back to those earliest. Um, so I assume we're talking about um, this slide. Oh, let me reshare the screen. Sorry about that. Um, I imagine we're talking about this slide and the. Um, These different circles. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so this is the this is the different island groups within the Ryukyu Islands, um, and each and, and the languages that are spoken there. So, the Amami language, the Okinawan language, which is somehow sometimes described as being two or three, sort of northern Okinawan, southern Okinawan, something like that. But the Amami language, the Okinawan language, the Miyako language, the Yayama language, and um, the Onaguni language. So. I was trying to point out sort of the, the diversity and the difference from Japan um, in the sort of fundamental uh, uh, fundamental Ryukyuan culture. Thank you so much for clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, she also asked, is there a movement for the Ryukyu Islands to leave Japan and become an independent nation? What about the base on Yoneguni, mm -hmm. uh, looking right at like Taiwan, China? Yeah. So. Um, there is an independence movement. Um, to my knowledge, uh, uh, broad, broad surveys of the people, you know, of the, the residents of Okinawa um, overall, um, 
and my, to my knowledge, have very, very rarely uh, uh, gotten, you know, particularly large, um, what am I trying to say? Relatively few people, very few people, you know, say that they want independence in these um, um, surveys. It's usually some, you know, just sort of, the people want greater equality, what they see as, you know, uh, greater equality, less discrimination, uh, something like that within Japan. They want, uh, some people want some form of autonomy, some kind of special status within Japan. Um, but, you know, actual uh, uh, independence, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't have a very strong, uh, very significant percentage of, you know, popular support. Um, but the movement definitely does exist. And um, if anybody is interested, they can look up um, Axels, A-C, A-C-S-I-L-S, um, which I don't recall off the top of my head exactly what that stands for, but um, uh, I can, yeah, maybe type it in the chat. You can look them up. Professor Seidman, okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you for spelling that out for us. Um, so our next question um, is from Ji Jiang Chan, um, asks, the Ming reacted quite strongly when the Kido Hideyoshi launched the invasion of Korea, but why did they not do the same thing when the Shimazu invaded Ryukyu? Yeah, that's a, that's an important excuse me an important question. Um, I don't know um, super detailed you know about um, uh, the Ming history you know in that period, but basically my impression is one of one of the key reasons um, was because uh, def uh, defending Korea from Hideyoshi's invasion took a lot out of the Ming. Um, basically, between uh, that that sort of if you want to call it foreign affairs aspect of the Ming defending Korea and various things that were going on inside um, uh, domestically sort of within China at that time between both of those the Ming was getting weaker um, and so I think that's that's a part of it um, and beyond that I, I'm not sure that I have a straight answer I'm sure that there's something about um, you know what exactly was the nature of the relationship. Uh, I'm not sure that the Ming ever promised that they would defend anybody to begin with. It wasn't necessarily part of the relation, the, part of the character of the relationship to begin with. Um, uh, so, yeah. So in addition to this, um, Cameron Noble asked um, or said, commented, you talked about the links between Japanese language and the Ryukyu languages and flows of people from the Japanese mainland, uh, from the Jimon period. Um, Japan maintain, uh, mainland has also both seen Okinawa as uh, part of Japan and not part of Japan at different times. Um, but recently, some J Chinese scholars have claimed Okinawa is part of China due to the Ryukyu Kingdom's tribute relationship with the Ming and Qing dynasties. Uh, what would you say to this claim? Um, speaking as a historian, um, the tribute relationship was never a territorial relationship. The Ming and Qing empires themselves never considered Okinawa to be part of their territory. Um, at various times in history, um, not only Ryukyu, but also Korea, um, Burma, Nepal, Vietnam, um, and for very, very brief periods, uh, Japan paid tribute to China. The idea that all of these lands were in any meaningful way truly part of China is just, uh, it's not what the tributary relationship was. It's, it's not. Uh, um, it's a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of um, of what that relationship was. So, um, of course, you know that doesn't mean that Okinawa. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much um, for for going into depth about that um, or clarifying rather. Um, with regards I, to let me yeah, sorry, let me let me just add very briefly that in 1879 or the 1870s, in the 1870s, when Japan was working on um, um, 
annexing Okinawa and you know abolishing the kingdom. There was at that time uh, some from some in Ryukyu who traveled to China to try to convince the Chinese the Qing Empire to do something. Um, and there was actually uh, a lot of um, interna uh, international tensions over it. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the Qing Empire and Japan almost came to war over it. Um, and um, General Grant, former president, U.S. Uh, U.S. Grant, um, played some role in negotiating um, for that to not happen, um, for there to not be war at that time in the 1870s. So, um, yeah, so there, I mean, you know, the Qing, there was a moment when the Qing almost stepped up to try to um, um, block Japan from taking over Okinawa. Um, so it's not as if they've been 100 entirely hands off. But, um, but yeah, I mean, they, even at that time, they were, uh, even at that time, the Qing were not taking over Okinawa themselves. Uh, it was never part of their territory. Thank you. Um... So Gabriella Worse asks, um, Japan claims the Senkaku Islands are part of, part of Okinawa Prefecture. Is this something that is found throughout historic documents, maps, or is there evidence on this as well? Senkakus are something I don't have very detailed knowledge about. Um, and I know it's a, it's a very touchy subject, and so I don't want to misspeak. Um, I think the Senkakus have been considered part of Okinawa Prefecture at various times in the 20th and 21st and maybe 21st centuries. Um, and I I'm not sure the extent to which the Ryukyu Kingdom ever sent anybody there, ever landed a person, ever landed a flag. I'm not sure the extent to which they ever considered that to be part of their territory. They might have. I'm not positive on that. Um, but um, 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 but even if they did, it, it, you know, it was not a very strong. Um, it's it the the historical documents are extremely vague on it. It's it's um, I don't believe it appears very often in the historical documents. You know any kind of particularly strong uh, evidence that it really was or that it yeah. So I. Mm. No worries. Thank you so much for giving us as much input as you can on on this um, particular topic. Um, so go, kind of going back to. Uh, U.S. bases. Um, Cam Cameron Noble asks, the reasons of why Okinawans are against U.S. bases is clear, but what are the reasons some Okinawans support the bases? Is it economic reasons, security reasons? I think there are a lot of reasons for supporting the bases. Um, I think uh, economic reasons is certainly part of it, um, and there are debates. Um, you know, it's not my expertise, and I won't weigh in on what, what really, you know, the bases really are or are not necessary to the economy. Uh, I'm not taking a, a side, but um, some people, you know, some people say that the bases are, um, you know, uh, crucial to the economy, that, you know, without them, the economy would struggle. Other people say the economy would flourish without even more without them. Um, but anyway, but also there's, there's individuals, there's a lot of people in Okinawa who work on base. There's a lot of people in Okinawa who have, um, friends or romantic relationships or marriages or whatever it is with Americans. Um, and there's a lot of people who don't work on base, but whose restaurants or whatever other businesses they run rely on, um, you know, rely on, on people from the bases as their customers. Um, and not just, you know, small businesses, but I'm sure industries as well. So, you know, it's very complicated in that way. And I think that also, a lot of people today, especially younger generations, grew up with it, and it's sort of part of the Okinawa that they know. Um, and uh, yeah. So, I've heard from mainland Japan or Japanese people, um, and also uh, a lot of foreigners that live in Japan, 
that um, the value in US bases being on Okinawa, um, the, the security reasons are very strong. Is there a fear among, or is there a thought amongst Okinawan people that the bases are necessary for that reason to avoid, you know, some type of invasion per se, or, or something of that nature, would you say? Yes, thanks for asking. I was actually, I should have, I forgot to mention that as part of my answer to the previous question, which is that also that a lot of Okinawans do believe that the bases are necessary to help protect Okinawa and Japan from uh, threats in the region, from aggression by certain other countries. Um, but there were also a lot of Okinawan, a lot of people in Okinawa who, um, who, who fear that because the bases are there, it makes Okinawa a target and it makes, uh, it increases the, the risk or the, the you know, um, increases the risk of Okinawa becoming um, either, you know, a battlefield on the ground or, you know, the target of attacks again. Um, yeah. I see. Um, so it's kind of like a two-edged sword type type of situation. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, so if, you know, if the, the U.S. military had not been based in Pearl Harbor, I'm not sure would there have been reason to attack Pearl Harbor. Well, I, I don't mean to, that, that's a whole other, <laughs> that may, maybe there was, but there's a lot of strategic reasons, but it's that kind of, right, it makes it, makes it a target. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> you can of worms, I shouldn't have said that. I, my apologies. It's a whole other, uh, and I'm speaking to people who are, you know, far more expert in geo geopolitical strategy and so forth and security than, than I am, so. Um, well, I think that's really interesting. It's a really interesting point to bring up. Um, but um, a question from Jeff, he asks, uh, what do you think we can actively do to try to improve the relationships in Okinawa while recognizing both the complex history of Okinawa and the geopolitical importance of stationing troops on Okinawa to regional security? And additionally, um, no, go ahead. Um, and additionally, where are we failing at repairing these relationships in a way that is meaningful for the Okinawan people? That's a big question. Um, I think this is really not my field of, uh, of expertise and I, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think, first of all, let me say, I think that my, my colleague, my good friend, Carl Gabrielson, um, if he were to give a talk in the series or, you know, he's, he's a person to talk to um, who has um, been doing active research on the military bases um, and off about exactly that question about the relationship and, and uh, um, how to repair it and what efforts have been made and stuff like that. Um, my answer at the risk of sort of I don't know, showing my, being too political, showing my hands, I don't know. My answer would be um, Tokyo and Washington agreed in 1995 to shut down the Futenma Air Base. It's been 30 years, almost. Um, so they agreed to shut down the Futenma Air Base and then people showed that they have strong opposition to the building of any kind of replacement or you know, new bases. So I wonder, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of exactly what Okinawan people feel or what would happen if this were to be the case, but as, a, as an individual, just as a non-voting in Japan <laughs> individual, um, my personal, I, I, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if they really did shut down Futenma and stop construction in, in Hinoko. Um, I wonder what that would do for, um, repairing the relationship, showing, you know, the, the goodwill um, or whatever, um, you know, while retaining the rest of the military presence that is important for security. That was a very complex question. But thank you so much for, for your answer with regards to his question. Um, do, in your opinion, or do you think we're, repairing, are we, we are failing at repairing? I think that's the second part of his question. Are we failing at repairing, trying to repair those relationships? To be honest, I, I 
I would have to, I, would, I think I would have to pass on, on answering that because I just, I don't know the precise ins and outs of, um, I don't know, I, there's a lot of people in Okinawa who are not so opposed, there are a lot of people in Okinawa who, you know, it, full range of opinions and feelings about it. And I know the military certainly, you know, has all kinds of friendship initiatives and, and different things that they do both, you know, on the ground and also, you know, at the top government levels. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, I couldn't, I'm not sure. No worries at all. Thank you so much, Professor Saifu for that. Um, so Eleanor Yamaguchi asks, um, the leadership in the pro to, uh, pre Tokugawa period was not a warrior class, but Confucian scholars, you said. Um, did Okinawa have a warrior class to protect the islands at all? Yeah, so um, to my, they didn't have a warrior class in the sense of it being built into the, the, um, uh, 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 the social class structure the way that um, Japan did, but I think probably more similar to China or Korea. I don't know the precise details of China and Korea, but you know, um, basically, I mean, all of these scholar officials were trained to at least to some extent in martial arts, and some of them um, were some of them were were uh, trained soldiers. They were trained warriors, so they they definitely had the kingdom definitely had its military. It had a strong enough military to take over all the other islands. Um, so they definitely had their own military, but just not a warrior class in the same sense. Hmm. I see. So um, with regards to the, the classes um, during this time, so I guess in mainland Japan, we think of like the samurai as being like one of the, if not the top class. Is there something similar in, in Okinawa at this time? Um, off the top of my head, I hope I'm not sort of forgetting some big <laughs> important difference, but uh, basically there's there's the, the royal family and the sort of very extended royal family. Below them, there's this scholar, scholar aristocracy, um, people who are born into sort of these noble families. Um, and then below them are commoners. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically how it was. Within that aristocracy, there were families that were, uh, um, you know, higher and lower, and there were, um, uh, like I said, nine nine court ranks um, that you could be, uh, uh, you know, higher ranking or lower ranking. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, so you mentioned uh, in, in the slide that you showed us that there were some different dialects and different, um, I guess, language, dialects or languages associated with the different islands or parts of Okinawa, um, how would you say like how many of those dialects or languages are still used amongst like younger Okinawan people today? Yeah, thanks, that's a good question. Um, I think first I should point out that I think, I think it's quite standard in Japanese to call them hogan, to call them dialects. Um, you ask people on the street, uh, even in Okinawa, I think most people would Call them Hogan, um, but linguists generally call them languages. So that's um, that's what that is. Um, and um, most, I mean, I don't. I, I'm, it, it varies. I'm sure it varies. There is um, there is certainly a small movement, a small effort to revitalize and, and you know re re increase. Um, the use of uh, uh, teaching and the spread of these native languages. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head sort of what the numbers are, what percentage of people speak it, you know, um, but um, it's definitely, I'm trying to get the right way to characterize it. Um, I don't know, more, uh, more young people than I might have expected do speak it. Um, to at least some extent, but I think a lot of people, a lot of people understand it much better than they can speak it, and um, and especially in the big cities like Naha, the vast majority of interaction is in standard Japanese or something more closely uh, approaching standard Japanese. Um, 
I have not been to the outer islands yet. I'm hoping to go. I'm planning to go the first time uh, in August. So we'll, I will discover for myself to what extent people are really speaking, in, you know, Yayama language or Miyako language in these other islands. Um, but um, I think also, you know, the efforts to revitalize it are unfortunately hindered a little bit by um, the fact that you're still part of the national Japanese curriculum. And so I think there's um, a, very limited ways in which a public school can offer Okinawan language and really teach it. And then also whatever, whatever amount of resources there are to teach Okinawan um, are resources that are not going into teaching Miyako or Yayama or Yanaguni, right? So, um, you know, as compared to, for example, efforts to revitalize um, the Hawaiian language, there's only one Hawaiian language. There's slight differences on some of the islands, but there's only one Hawaiian language. And so whatever resources you have can be put into that. Whereas in Okinawa, you have six languages. Um, and so it's more difficult. Interesting, but it's nice to know, uh, according to what you said, that a lot of young people still have interest in, you know, those those native dialects, regardless of, you know, the standardized Japanese education. Mm -hmm. so interesting. And I think a lot of people who might not happen to, you know, there, there, there's those people who are really showing interest in trying to learn it, and there's people who, um, you know, happen to have learned it from their grandparents and just happen to absorb it, right? That's the beautiful thing about as culture kind of, you know, evolves. Yeah, I should, I, I, I meant, um, I attended a, a sort of speech contest at one point, 2016, um, people giving prepared talks in Okinawan language. And the, I don't remember the precise ages, but I think basically the speakers ranged from elementary school age to people in their eighties. And so uh, it was, that was really cool. Yeah, that is really, that's really awesome to, to see that. And hopefully um, in mainland Japan, like through like um, Okinawan festivals, and of course, as you know, um, Okinawan people have kind of spread out, you know, hopefully we're also being, are able to experience that in mainland Japan as well. Mm. Um, frequently. Um, so I guess my final question, um, it comes from Vivian. Ying, um, do you have any insight on external influences on Okinawan martial arts over the course of history? I'm afraid I don't know that much about martial arts. Um, I apologize. Um, uh, we do know that, you know, um, karate, uh, which is known in Okinawan as tea, um, is an Okinawa, originally an Okinawan um, martial art, right? And quite a few of the other martial arts uh, that are, you know, kind of widely known about are also from Okinawa. Um, rather than from mainland Japan. Um, and um, I'm sure that they drew strong influence from China, but I don't really know the, the ins and outs of it. I'm afraid, sorry. No worries. Thank you so much, Professor Seifman, um, for your time today and for your presentation and, and taking time out of your evening to be with us. More than that, thank you so much uh, for answering um, a lot of questions um, on, on some you know sensitive topics. We really appreciate uh, your efforts in, in trying to give us the best possible answer with, with the knowledge that you have. Um, but um, I want to once again thank the, our program sponsors, the Japan Foundation New York. Um, and lastly, I would like to present some upcoming events. While you're getting that together, let me just very quickly say thank you so much to everyone who attended. And I, there's so many questions here in the chat. So I apologize that we haven't been able to get to all of them. Jeff, could you please share? Yes, give me one second. I'll share instead. And yes. And as thank you once again, Professor Seifman, and to our audience for all of the really good questions tonight. Okay, so our next Getting to Know Japan webinar is going to be next Tuesday, June 27th at 10 a.m. on Zoom. It is on Japan's role 
in the Cold War. Dr. Narushige Michishita will be our speaker for that webinar. The next community conversations event will be on Wednesday, June 28th. It begins at 1730 with refreshments and 1830 with the presentation itself. This is an in-person event in Misawa. So if you are a uh, local in Misawa, we ask that you please join us for the event. It is on Chinese People's Liberation Army under the Xi Jinping re regime. And this is next Wednesday, June 28th. And uh, our next uh, Thursday uh, Getting to Know Japan webinar is on Shin Shinzo Abe's legacy. It's going to be on Thursday, July 6th at 1900. Um, Dr. Tomohiko Taniguchi will be the speaker for this event. Um, this event, I think, will be very interesting because this is a couple days before the one-year anniversary of Prime Minister Abe's assassination. So it will be really interesting to hear his thoughts about uh, Shinzo Abe's legacy. So once again, please join us for these events if you have time to join us online or if you have time to join us in person in Misawa. And uh, one more uh, event, uh, Jeff. Yes, I just wanted to mention, um, since of course today's topic is Okinawa, we, we don't have it uh, up yet. Uh, I'm still finalizing all of the details, uh, but uh, we will be having our next in-person event in Okinawa for the Community Conversations series as well. Uh, that's going to be coming up on August 26th. So uh, just putting that out there, if if you happen to be in Okinawa, if you'd like to come to more YCAPS events uh, with the topic of Okinawa, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Nozoe from Okinawa International University speaking. Uh, we're usually doing those in American Village, um, so please be on the lookout for that. And we hope to see you there in person. Thank you, Amani, for giving me that time. No worries. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us this evening. We hope that you'll join us again next week. And thank you once again, Professor Seifman, for your time today. We hope to see you next time. Bye. Thanks again, everyone. This was fantastic.